You're listening to Cattails. Hi, and welcome to this edition of Cattails. I'm Cat, and today I have a rabbit with Rockney legend Chaz Hodges. As one half of Chaz and Dave, he wrote and recorded exceptionally witty songs about life in a unique style of a London pub sing-along with a bit of musical humour and boogie-woogie piano thrown in. Authentic and charming, Chaz reminisces about the early days, provides some sound advice on life and speaks about his other projects, Down the Allotment. This is the one with Chaz Hodges. Hi Chaz, it's lovely to speak to you at last. How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely fine, yeah, really, really top, top class. Top class, that's brilliant. Well, may I just start by asking how you, your treatment's been going and how you're feeling now? You say you're top class there, which is wonderful news. Um, how's it all going? Well, all my treatment has finished. Uh, I've had a scan and I spoke to the doctor about a week ago and he said the scan was fine. He said, I don't need to see you till the end of the year. So it's just all good news. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant news. I'm thrilled to hear that. And no doubt you are too. And of course, you're now going back on the road, aren't you? Because that's, uh, you had a little bit of a, a stop while you had your treatment, but you're back on your tour, aren't you? Well, that's right. There were, uh, a lot of the gigs <coughs> obviously had to be rescheduled and... Uh, now we're catching up on them, and uh, yeah, we, we more or less. Well, we've done uh, three or four so uh, so far. Uh, played Clacton last uh, Saturday, so now we're we're into uh, catching up on the rescheduled gigs. Yeah, enjoying it very much. Brilliant. Well, life seems to throw a curveball, doesn't it, quite often to us, and it makes us respond in a way that we maybe not expect. So, you know, all things for the best in the long run. I sometimes say. Um, just that's looking... it. Yeah, I mean, you just. Uh, I mean, when I was first told, obviously, I was uh, just for the first uh, few minutes, really, sort of thinking, hang on, what's happening? But so, but it's, it was only about half an hour. I thought, well, I've, I've called it quick. Um, I've got good doctors looking after me, so I just, you know, it didn't faze me at all. It's just another part of the journey, Charles, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, just thinking about your life like that, though, I mean, obviously you've had a lovely long career in the music industry and it's had its ups and downs, etc. Um, but you actually came into the music industry at a very young age, didn't you? I understand your mum played piano um, and you wanted to and wanted you to play as well, but you didn't feel like you wanted to go that route. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, in the very early days, yeah, when I was very young, I mean, my mum always wanted there to be a musician in the family. <laughs> well, my older brother, Dave, didn't show any. He was more into uh, football and sports. Uh, and um, she knew I had a, a, an ear for music uh, at a very young age. And I remember her saying to me once, because she, she brought us up playing the piano because my dad died uh, when we were very young. Mm. Um, but she virtually brought us up playing the piano. Um and I remember she was playing the piano in uh, a pub in Edmonton one Saturday afternoon and she came running home really excited. She said, there's a uh, a music teacher um, and he's quite well known in Edmonton. Um, and he said to me, he said, I, he said, I lo really love the way that you play, Daisy. So I can't figure out what you're doing, but it sounds good. If you've got any children, he said, I'll teach them for nothing. Oh, Remember, she came home and she said to me, she told me this, she said, he'll teach you piano for nothing. And I said, I don't want to learn piano. What do I want to learn piano for? I'm more, I'd, I'd like playing football and going fishing and playing out in the street. And all the kids I knew that, that uh, took piano lessons, you, you come and say, you know, nice summer's evening, you're going out over the park, play football. And they go, they go oh, no, we've got to do a piano lesson. So oh. it didn't sound very exciting. <laughs> Does it, does it? <laughs> so um, not uh, later on, um, I must have been about 12 when skiffle became a big craze in uh, in Britain. Terrific. And I heard Lonnie Donegan and I decided I wanted to play the guitar. So I told my mum this and she was excited about that and she got an old guitar for me from uh, my uncle Alf over at Acne. He had an old guitar that he had for years. And... Uh, she got it for me, and she actually learned to play it before I did, and and she learned to play the guitar and taught it to me. That's how uh, that's how much she wanted there wow. to be a musician. <laughs> she was determined. And it was um, <laughs> while I was in the skiffle group, um, I saw Jerry Lee Lewis come to me hometown in 1958, and then made me want to play the piano. So 
brilliant. So yeah, eventually I I did uh, my my mum's wishes did come true in the end. I become a piano player. In the end, she got her wish. Bless her. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned Joey Lee Lewis there. Am I right in saying that you were actually in in his backing band at one point in the sixties? That's right. I saw him when I was in the skiffle group, and I was thirteen at the time when he came came to my hometown, Edmonton. He played at the Regal Edmonton, and um, that was it. I was hooked. I had to learn to play the piano. And uh, in nineteen sixty three, I'd gone from guitar onto bass guitar, and I was then in a band called the Outlaws. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Richie Blackmore on lead guitar, and uh, I was playing the bass. We had like a four-piece band, and um, we see an advert in the newspaper in um, uh, the Melody Maker uh, that um, there was a tour happening with Gene Vincent and Jerry Lee Lewis. Wow! Don Arden was bringing it up. Anyway, we give him a call, and he came down and auditioned the band, and he liked the band. And he said, well, Gene Vincent needs a band. He said, but so does Jerry Lee Lewis. He said, who do you want? So it was no choice as far as I was concerned. It was Jerry Lee for me. And, uh, yeah, we went on tour with him in 1963, and I I just learned so much on the piano on on that tour, uh, just watching him every night. So was that the bit that that lit the flame, was it, for your piano playing, and the rest, as they say, is history? Well, I suppose you could put it like (laughs) that, yeah. (laughs) Brilliant. Well, you you did, in fact, play with a lot of people, didn't you, as a Sessions musician? I understand you were in Albert Lee's band at one point, Heads, and, Heads Hands and Feet, weren't you? And um, supported by the Beatles, I, I hear. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll cut a long story short. My first professional band was The Outlaws. That was, uh, and we recorded up at Joe Meeks. Uh, he was an independent engineer, quite a legendary engineer mm-hmm. and uh, record producer we called it up at him at his uh, studio at holloway road we made records uh, we we become his house band and uh, we backed everybody from like john layton to heinz to all the all the artists that he used to get up there uh then the band uh um went on i joined cliff bennett and the rebel rousers and uh we toured with the beatles Wow. Um, then after that, I, I was in a band called Ed's Hands of Feet that you just mentioned with a mate of mine, Albert Lee. We toured America. I'm cutting a long, long story short it's here. It's a long it's, career, uh, Charles. It's a long career, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, the bit about the Beatles, I got to know uh, the Beatles when we toured uh, with them in, um, it was 1966, uh mm. With Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rouse, we toured. We did their. Um, we supported them on their latest, their last European tour. Right. And uh, on that tour, uh, Paul McCartney uh, called us into their dressing room, and they were playing the Acetate uh, to their latest album, which became Revolver. And he said, "There's a song on here. He said, be great for your band.' And it was got to get you into my life. Mm. And uh, we loved it. And uh, he said. I'll produce it for you if you want. And we said, oh, yes, yes, please. So when we got back to England, uh, we all went into Abbey Road and Paul produced it. And that that record got to number six in uh, in 1966. Wow, that's amazing. So so then how did you move from touring with with those guys to forming Chaz and Dave then? You know, obviously you've got your own Rockney style now. How did that all become about from, from that kind of background? Well, it was being on the road. Uh, I mean, you, when you're on the road, you, you're earning your living, but also you're meeting other people, you're getting experience. Um, I mean, just the experience of of uh, working with the Beatles. I mean, just, just observing them from afar. I, I remember, you know, you take it in, you think, at that time, they were the biggest band around the world. Mm. They were still so we came, we all came back on the plane together, and I remember they were just so enthusiastic about their latest album. So, ah, oh, this song, this is going to be great. And in those days, uh, they had Uncle Mac used to be a children's used to play children's records on a Saturday morning. Mm. Uh, and, oh, Uncle Mac's going to love Yellow Submarine, and I just loved their enthusiasm. So I was 
absorbing everything all along the way with in bands like the Outlaws and then Cliff Bennett touring with the Beatles and then Ed Sands and Feet. We toured America as one of the most fantastic uh, times of my life, just touring right across America in, in everywhere from, from north to south. We was over there for about uh, two and a half months, I think. Wow. So all this I was taking in at the time. And then there became a time I thought, right, okay. And it was when I was in America and I was singing in an American accent and I thought, I feel a bit of a fraud <laughs> singing in an American yeah. accent for Americans. So there became, okay, it's now time for me to do something and not be just a member of a band. Yeah. And I, I thought, well, I want to write songs about things that I know about, singing my own accent, uh, and uh, just see what happens. I want to become myself, in short. Yeah. And I Dave uh, for a good eight years along this time, uh, along this period. Uh, so I called him up when I got back from America and suggested the idea of uh, getting together and uh, writing songs uh, about things that we know and uh, singing in our own accents and. Uh, he was up for it, so there became uh, the start of Chaz and Dave around about 1972. Wow, that's amazing. And so really, you, you've, you've got this idea, you, you want to be authentic to yourself, you want to write about yeah. stuff that you know about. Was it a big leap then from actually playing in somebody else's band to starting to form those lyrics, that music, and actually do that, you know, communicate what you had in your head? Was that a difficult thing? Well, it's like anything I've approached in life. I've never, ne ne I've never liked drastic overnight changes. Uh, I think if you gradually feel your way into anything new, then you can find your way better. And when you get there, you can stay there. Um, that's exactly what we did with Chaz and Dave. We straight away uh, were going out, um, doing pubs and, and clubs as a duo, uh, to mainly pay the rent, really. Mm. But we love playing gigs anyway, so it was a twofold thing. We love gigging and uh, obviously love getting paid for gigging, so that paid our rent. And we began to write songs in the daytime together and uh, we would try these songs out without announcing them on stage. You know, we'd play in a club somewhere. There might be, like, I don't know, 100 people or whatever. And uh, we'd just slot them in and just try them out for our own benefit to, to sort of iron them out and just to sort of, uh, you know, think, oh, there's too many verses or it needs an extra verse. And then along the way, people would come up and say, hey, I love that one you did in, you do in the middle, that, that Gertrude thing, <laughs> what's that? Where did you get that from? So, oh, yeah, we wrote that one. So we would gradually start putting our own songs into the set and dropping the cover songs. And... Uh, the, when people come up and went, hey, they pick them, pick out one of our songs in amongst all these marvellous established songs that we were covering, we thought, yeah, OK, we're up there, we're doing the right thing. So that, that's how we did it. Eventually, the, uh, the, in, the initial act become uh, all of our songs. As, uh, the, the more we start, more we wrote, the more songs we put in. And then before we knew it, uh, the Chaz and Dave act was uh, just full of Chaz and Dave songs. Wow, that must have felt so good though, mustn't it? That people were actually recognising your songs and saying, I like that. That feedback and that, that sort of, you know... That is, is, that is exactly it. I mean, we had a, a feeling that was the way to do it, but all these years later when we've spoken to established artists, uh, people like who we are big admirers of, say Lonnie Donegan, who was so uh, such a big uh, artist in the 50s and the 60s he said that's exactly how they did it they would, they would he would be playing in the Chris Barber band he said and we would just put songs in and if we did it a couple of times and it weren't getting any reaction we'd drop it and put something else in he said so, so you would you give the you give the audience what you think you should give them and then take from the audience let them pick out from you. You don't let the audience dictate what they want. You give them what you want, and then let them choose from what you've given them what, right. what I'm doing. Yeah. And that's how we've always done it. It's, uh, 
why to this day, I mean, we, we we dare not miss any of the hit songs out. I mean, if we if we uh, we never work to a list, but there has been times we've come off stage and uh, forgotten to do Rabbit or forgotten oh, to do yeah. Gertrude or oh. Down a Margaret. And be before happy. you know it, shouting out, can't do Gertrude, can't do Gertrude. So, uh, you know, it's nice to know that uh, all our the songs that we've written over the years, it, the, the people just want them, and if we don't do them, they send us straight back up on I stage. I bet they sure do. We... I bet they do. Did it take you all by surprise, though? You know, you've got your hits coming and you, you, your sets becoming more and more of your own songs. But then the success was absolutely phenomenal, wasn't it? Worldwide success. Did that take you by, you know, a bit of a surprise? Not at all. Mm. Not at all. In fact, it took longer than I thought it was going to Did it? Take. Amazing. When we first started, I thought it's so different what we're doing, so refreshing uh, to what is going on in the charts. But when people were was was trying to impress with this is cool and this ain't, you know, it's mm. all like uh, moody guys. And I thought we're going to get out of with some good, honest music and uh, take take the world by storm. And, uh, well, we got together in 72, but it wasn't until 79 that we had our first hit, which was Gertrude. So I was quite surprised that it took that long. I thought we would have been, we'd have had hits by, you know, 73, 74. But, uh, yeah, as I say, um, going back to what I first said, it didn't matter that much because I knew we would get there, so we would gradually get there step by step. And uh, from 79 onwards, yeah, the, the... you know, we've had, uh, I haven't counted them, but loads of hits. You certainly have. Yeah, it's it's incredible, isn't it, that it took that time to take off. I, I can see what your thinking is there, because it's so different. I wonder whether or not at the time, though, because it was different, is why it took a little bit longer to really be established by the masses. Uh, but when it did take off, it was incredible. Yeah, I think you're right. That's why I go back to the first thing I said, is like, uh, don't rush it, just do it bit by bit, uh, little and often, step by step. That's my motto is like, you know, just get there. And that's the advice I'd give to anybody is like, um, if if you get to the, if I, if we had have got a hit record straight away, who'd have, who'd have known? I mean, it might have been too soon. We might, mm. might have handled it differently. But when you gra- you're gradually getting there, uh, once you do get there, you find it easier to stay there. So yeah. there is about it. I think that's a general philosophy of life anyway. I if think, things yeah. happen to you quick, it's like winning the lottery. I don't think that is gonna, that is good for anybody, winning the lottery. They always think it's going to be, but I don't think it is. An old member, a teacher at school saying, uh, if you work for something and it, you, you get a lot of money and, because you've worked for it and then you buy something that you've really wanted. I mean, to me, it might be a grand piano or someone else. It might be a car. He said, you will value that far more than if you win it on the uh, football pools, which was the thing in those days. And I can remember thinking, well, what's the difference? You've got it anyway. But now I'm, you know, as I got older, I thought, yes, he's dead right. You do value it if you've, if you have worked for it, you think, yeah, that hasn't come easy. So I really do value it. Uh, you know, that is for, for my hard work that I've got that. And so he was very, very, it was very, very true yeah. Good what advice. he said. Yeah, good advice, wasn't it, really? And and I think, really, when you look around at the, you know, the, the people who've influenced you, you know, you've just mentioned, you know, that incident there. Um, looking the other way about the amount of people that you have influenced in the music industry. I mean, you've had riffs sampled by Eminem and the Libertines and Tom Jones, and it's been quite incredible, the influence you've had. Has that surprised you? Well, that is that wasn't something that um, you know when you're le- you're learning yourself when when you as you uh, I mean you're learning all the time I mean you never stop learning I'm learning now I mean I'm learning a, a new piano piece right this minute so when you are doing that you don't think of yourself as influencing somebody else because you don't ever sit back and think oh I'm established now I can sit back and influence people so yes that is a nice bonus when that happens if we we go to, to to gigs and quite often meet people after, and uh, it's a great. It happens all the time there. I get young kids coming up, and he goes, 
oh, I'm playing the piano now, and it's because of you that I learned to play when oh, I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, That's I lovely. mean, even like Jamie Cullum, you know, we've become friends with him. He said, yeah, he said, I watched you when I was really younger. He said, you were one of the ones that influenced me to, to want to play the piano. So that is a lovely bonus. That's something I didn't expect. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. I mean, yeah. you've obviously had a great career, but then, of course, in 2009, you you know, it all disbanded a bit, didn't it? Because, you know, Dave's wife died and you decided to call yeah. it a day. Did you think that was it and that you would never perform again? No, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm, born, I'm born to perform. Uh, even before I met Dave, I was, I was out there gigging for, you know, eight or nine years before me and Dave got together. Um, when Dave packed up, I mean, I knew he'd come back sooner or later. He, he needed time off. His wife had just died. And when somebody close to you dies, you, you can't see beyond the end of your nose for a while. But as time goes on, it, you start to think a little bit better and you gradually start to come back. So, I mean, I carried on. I still do now. Chaz in his band. I still do the odd gig. I'm doing one Saturday at Wilton's Music Hall. So I just carried on on my own uh, uh, until Dave was ready to come back. So it never stopped for me at all. But no. Dave had a, a little bit of a rest, and uh, but now, yeah, he's, he's, he's back for good. Yeah, and you've had lots of bits and pieces that you've done besides that, haven't you? As you said, apart from, you know, Chaz and Dave, you've obviously had your, your own music as well, and you've been doing a, 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 a column, I understand, for the Daily Express for, you know, rock and yeah. roll allotment and... Yeah, I've been get, always keeping my allotment going, uh, and I've always grown my own. Uh, since 1972, I've been uh, growing organic when people didn't know what it was. I mean, all my kids have been brought up by uh, the organic stuff that uh, I used to grow and still am growing. And uh, I ended up writing a book. I did did uh, an autobiography, and um, which is out there now. It's called All About Us, uh, Chaz and Dave, uh, by... Chaz Hodges, mm -hmm. and uh, when I finished that, I got so into it, and uh, um, I wanted to write about something else, and it was my wife's idea. She said, "Well, you've been you've been uh, growing your own for years before it was trendy. Yeah. Why don't you write a book about that?" So that's what I did, and that's uh, where well, it's still on sale now. Chaz's Rock and Roll Allotment, Wonderful. and the allotment goes. So well, but, uh, beside the music, I mean, it's five minutes round the corner on my bike. It, it makes you, it's so healthy. Mm. Uh, you know, if I'm writing a song, I should be around there later on. I'm, I'm going to finish uh, so, or do a bit more on, on the piano. But when you've been sitting at the piano for like an hour and a half, two hours, you can feel a bit cloudy and you think, oh, it's nice to get out in the air and just get around the allotment and just feel so good, get a bit of real oxygen down you, yeah, and you come back, and quite often I'm around there, and uh, more often than not, something I've been sitting trying to think of at the piano comes to me immediately when I'm uh, sowing seeds or doing a bit of uh, digging or weeding around the allotment, so the two work perfectly together. Yeah, a bit of grounding, isn't it? It helps you clear your head and get your, get 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 centred again. I love yeah, that. Yeah, as I say, it's not an alternative to music. It it goes exactly right alongside it. It uh, one feeds the other. Wonderful. So where do you think you're going to be heading then, Chaz? I mean, you've got all this behind you. You've got lots of stuff going on at the moment. If there's one thing that you really would love to do, what would that be? Well, it's not, I mean, for a start, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is writing songs. I'm writing songs all the time. And uh, you never know, like this time next year, it's almost like having babies, you know. I don't know what the songs are going to be like. I think this time next year, uh, there's going to be new songs that I've written. I don't even know what they're going to be yet and what they're going to be about. But hopefully there'll be people singing them, songs that I've written. Uh, so that's the... Uh, one exciting thing that never ends, that never ends for a songwriter. I mean, you, 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 uh, you, you're always writing. I mean, Paul McCartney, with, he's become, I haven't seen him, don't see him much, but he's become like a showbiz friend. We sort of keep in touch. Mm. And he's the same, he's writing all the time, he's getting ideas all the time. So, so, uh, and when you're gigging, I mean, gigging is just, uh, it's part of my way of life anyway. It's like eating and drinking and sleeping. If I don't gig for 
for a period of time. I really feel it. So it's really that nice now that uh, all my treatment's finished. Uh, the doctors don't want to see me till the end of the year, and they just want to check up uh, that I can get back and do these gigs. So you know, there's enough there before anything else. There's, there's no big. I've never. Um, uh, you know, great big ambitions. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this to, to show I'm top of the world. I've, I've never been into that. I think uh, uh, everything I've done, I've got to be. It's like I've never been in competition with anybody. But I, well, I have been in competition with somebody, and that's myself. That's the only yeah. person I've. I always gauge it by what I'm doing myself. I think is that you know. Is that acceptable to me? Yeah. Uh, I accept that. I'm two people. I can sit by, sit back and judge what I've just done and go, is that any good, Chaz? Are you, are you happy with that? And you go, no, no, not really. I could do a little bit better there and I have a little talk to myself and then on I go. So that's the way I, that's the way I go through life. You're, the, you're your own worst critic by the, by the sounds of it, Chaz. Yeah, well, and that's good because it makes you, you know, it, it it goes without saying that you're never satisfied with uh, anything but second best. And that don't mean to say I'm a fussy person because there's a lot of things I do in music that someone else would go, oh, that sounds wrong, that. But I'm a great believer if that, that uh, I quite often say to somebody, well, look, that... That might look, it looks wrong and it sounds wrong, but it's right. It feels right to me. It's like jazz, if you like. Yeah. Uh, so I can judge something. I think if it's got the feeling, someone else can say, well, technically that's wrong. And they have said that to me in the past. I said, oh, you've got a major ninth uh, going alongside a flattened fifth there in G. Uh, uh, musically, that's wrong. And I go, look, it looks wrong. It sounds wrong. But it's right. Yeah, it's about the feeling, isn't it? I really like yeah. that idea and just going with the flow of everything. That's a yeah. great philosophy in life, Charles. I like that. Very nice. Well, yeah, you've got to judge that. A lot of people can't judge that. They can judge it. They judge it like doing a mathematic puzzle. Uh, you know, two and two has got to make four. But in music, two and two can make five. Yeah, and you gave the example there of jazz, which actually is all about free flow, isn't it, and free form, and just going with the feel of it. And that's ultimately what it's about, isn't it? There's no rules. If it feels right, it's right. I like that. No rules. Yeah. Oh, Chaz, it's been wonderful speaking with you. I can't believe how quickly that, that time has just gone. And I'm looking at all the dates you've got on your website here. You've got an enormous amount of dates, so I'm just going to urge people to go out there and see you. Um, if they visit chasandave.net, that's the best place to go, is it? Yeah, or uh, is it chasandave.net? Yeah, but you'll get us up. Just Chas and Dave website gigs, put up gigs and... Uh, and up there will pop. That's wonderful. And, uh, and I will be coming along to see you as well soon. So I can't wait to see you in action as well. And thank you for all the years of fun you've given us. And uh, may there be many, many more. Yes, there certainly will be. Thank you very much, Chaz. That's been wonderful. You take care. Oh. Speak soon. All right, my darling. You've been listening to Cattails. To listen again to this and other tales, go to cattails.co.uk.